I'm going to talk about cognitive biases today. So, what's a cognitive bias? Well, you ever had that experience where you check your phone for the time and then you put it down and you can, can't remember what time it is? So you do it again and it happens again three or four times? That's a cognitive bias, specifically one affecting your memory. A cognitive bias is essentially a process in your brain that affects the way you behave. And specifically, it affects the way you behave in ways that make you act more or less irrationally, is the descriptor. Ways that don't necessarily make sense for your stated desires and goals. So just to get this out of the way, it's not a logical fallacy. And if the math scares you, don't worry about it. It just says the two aren't the same thing. A logical fallacy is something where you're making an argument and you're doing something like argument from uh, ignorance or you're doing argument from authority. It's not the same thing as a cognitive bias. Logical fall fallacies happen kind of up here. I have no idea if I'm on camera or not. Um, logical fallacies kind of happen up here. And cognitive biases are occurring down kind of at the hardware level of your brain, the firmware level almost, where you're not even aware of them. So there's your brain. Everybody's got one. Assume that you have an input, some kind of sensory input to that brain. In this case, you've got a sphere or in a sphere, a circle, excuse me. What you would expect based on your standard assumptions and expectations about how your brain works is that you get a behavior that results from that input. You have an input like, I put my hand on the stove, that's hot, I'm going to pull my hand back. Some of that happens automatically, some of that happens consciously, but you expect that it is a rational, correct decision based on the world. Well, you can run into some problems if you think, hey, that circle is actually a cylinder, but in reality, it's a cone. What, at this point, you have a disconnect between the image of the world in your brain, the thing that you have conjured up to represent the world, and the actual world itself. And this is the realm of where cognitive biases start to get really tricky and really weird. So why should you even care about these? Well, there are 171 cognitive biases listed on Wikipedia, which is clearly the authoritative source. But it gives you a good idea of if even Wikipedia has 171 of these things, and I mean they're referenced with studies, how many of them are actually out there? How many of these things actually exist? Which leads you to the next question, why? Why do we even have these? What's going on in your brain that makes you do strange things, have these cognitive biases? Well. Nobody's really sure, but we have some pretty good thoughts about it. One other thing, thoughts, is that your brain developed in a environment that had a specific set of data. It had a bunch of inputs that it could generally rely on. Things like seasons, things like days, things like water is wet and good, things like, oh, food that is high in sugar and high in uh, fat, I want that. And it developed heuristics based on those data. Things like, oh, this fatty, salty food, yes, give me that. Give me more of that because it's really caloric and I need all the calories I can get. It turns out when you take those things, pretty trivially, obviously, in this example, turn that into a modern society where we don't have to worry about scarcity as much anymore. The thing that makes you keep wanting sugar and salt and fat, that's pretty bad. It can lead to behavior that doesn't really make sense because your brain is still screaming at you from back in the day going, you need to eat all of these McDonald's fries. It's very important that you do that because you could be running from a tiger later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, not after eating a whole bunch of McDonald's fries, but <clears throat> your brain doesn't quite get that there's a difference between the data you're receiving now and the data you're receiving then. And in some cases, like economic markets, we take heuristics that evolved for a completely different purpose and kind of apply them over here and society has gone, yeah, that's close enough, great, and walked away, and you can get some very strange behaviors as a result of it. Is there any sort of logic to these things? Do they break out? Like, there's 171 of these things listed. How do you group them? How do you categorize them? You can do it a couple different ways, slice it a couple different ways. One of them is you can slice it between things that apply to groups and things that apply to individuals. There are cognitive biases that only apply to you in a group setting versus cognitive biases that only apply to you when you're acting as an individual. 
You can split it three ways between things like desirability, how desirable you see something, how desirable you, an action is, versus the probability of an act occurring or your expectation of what causes that act, or how your memory functions. You can split it three ways like that. Or you can do this one, which is pretty interesting. They kind of break it between what they call it hot and cold, where hot is a, you are engaged, you have emotion, you have intent, so there's this motivation behind your actions at that point. You are acting and engaging that way versus cold uh, biases. And cold biases happen kind of without you noticing, without you doing anything. They just, it's part of the base level functioning of your brain. So an example, and I'm going to give you lots of examples, but we're, today we're going to talk about pareidolia and apophenia, which are two Greek words. Merriam-Webster gives us these fun definitions. Pareidolia is the tendency to perceive a specific, often meaningful image in a random or ambiguous visual pattern. Apophenia is the tendency to perceive a connection between a meaningful pattern between unrelated or random things. And I guarantee that every one of you has experienced this because I guarantee that every single one of you has seen this. That's not a face. That is a circle, two ellipses, and three lines. It's not a face. But your brain really thinks that's a face. And it thinks it's a smiling face, no less. A face that's imbued with emotion. And you got that off of a yellow dot with some stuff thrown on it. Here's a slightly more famous one. The man in the moon, or the rabbit in the moon, depending on where you come from. Here's one that's always fun. Both of these are on Mars. There's our friend the smiley face again. Or the uh, pretty famous one off the Viking lander, the Sidonian uh, Martian face. That's not a face, that's rocks. We went back there with Mariner and a bunch of other things and took pictures and it looks nothing like a face if you actually get it from the right angle. This is not a smiley face. Asteroids did not make a smiley face because somebody was you know, shooting, really bored aliens shooting asteroids at Mars. That's not what happened. Those are not anything meaningful. That's just your face, your brain going, oh God, that really looks like a face. And coming back and telling you that's a face. And you can say no and your brain will go, yeah, that's definitely a face. <laughs> right? It's really hard not to see that as a face. Any, mean, like, any structural pattern like that, you're gonna per perceive as a face. Here's some really cool examples. We've been doing this for ages. I mean, you've got the, the old man of the mountain in New Hampshire before it collapsed. You can see the face in profile. You have this one from the Ukraine, it's Baba Yaga. You kind of see the nose in profile and kind of the witch face, right? We've been doing this for a long time, pretty much since recorded human history. But it really isn't even just faces, nor is it just natural stuff. Anybody ever taken this test? Probably not, you're familiar with it though. The Rorschach ink blots. This is a test designed to evoke pareidolia and apophenia. They're completely, not completely, but they're random patterns. They don't look like anything really, but your brain just goes, I can't deal with that. Have you presented me with something that looks like it should look like something? And so your brain just goes digging and pulls up whatever it can find. So the purpose of the test is actually go, well, what do you come back with? If you come back with images about blood, or violence, well, if you, you know, believe Rorschach, that's important. If you come back with puppies and kittens or two people dancing, you're probably more healthily balanced, again, according to Rorschach. But it turns out that not even just humans do this. Anybody see these going around the internet earlier? This is Google's deep dream stuff. They took a neural network and they taught it to recognize images. And then what they did is they took the output of different layers and started feeding it back in, just kind of feedback, and pulling in output out of specific places. So this is kind of an intermediate level of Google's image analysis. And it turns out that it's creepy as hell. <laughs> I mean, there's eyes all over this, there's dogs up at the top. Sometimes there's like, there's two dogs kind of merged together, beer slammed. You get these weird noir, or, uh, noir patterns, like glowing colors. It's kind of hypnotic and strange. It's like a computer on an acid trip. But what it's doing here is it's going, oh, I'm pulling patterns out of what I think is random data. It has no idea what 
I'm assuming these were baskets of vegetables or pies or something at some point. It doesn't know what those are. It doesn't understand the context of any of those, but it does know, oh, that kind of looks like an eye. And since eyes have been pushed forward in its evaluation, it says, I want to be looking for eyes because eyes are important. It starts seeing eyes everywhere and telling the other layers in the neural network, I see eyes here, or I see dogs here, because dogs are also important. We don't know. <laughs> Google's a very strange place. So it's a computer doing the same thing that your brain is doing, going, hey, I think these things are important. You should be paying attention to them, regardless of whether or not there are dogs up there in the original image. It honestly doesn't matter that the computer thinks there are. But it isn't even just visual stuff. Let me see if I get it going. Hello. How do we do that? A little just a pencil. And what's Queen? How many people heard it's fun to smoke marijuana? <laughs> Only you are. <laughs> Incorrect. A large number of people heard it's fun to smoke marijuana. How many people remember the Tickle Me Elmo scandal? Back when Tickle Me Elmos were a thing. Where Tickle Me Elmo said something very rude if you played his message backward at a specific uh, speed. Did they actually say that? Is backmasking, which is what this is called in music, actually a thing? Judas Priest, you can find it everywhere. And then now there's people actually doing it intentionally because this craze happened. Because people were very obsessed about music and like what was being said backwards in the lyrics and if Satan was putting them there. You, you think I'm laughing and I'm not, or like I'm joking and I'm totally not. There was a really big scandal about a lot of this. Or not scandal, but you know, moral panic. So the, that's paradelia, or paradelia rather. That's apophenia. That's your brain going, I can't handle the fact that this is random. There's got to be a pattern here. Come on. You're not going to do it either. And it isn't just audio or visual either. We do this with random data. We do this a lot. Anybody remember this XKCD cartoon? This superstition is pretty much apophenia and paradelia in action. Paradelia in action. Us going, oh God, there has to be some reason behind this. There's a couple other cognitive biases that tie into superstition, but I kind of I don't want I don't want to get into those today. I'll get into them later. But this underlies the like, apophenia underlies a lot of this. Us looking at a set of data that is essentially random and going, I'm going to correlate this or I'm going to die trying. So why does this even exist? We've seen a lot of examples. Why is your brain doing this? Well, like a lot of these cognitive biases, we don't know. We have a bunch of good guesses, though. And here's a really cool partial hypothesis. It turns out that knowing who someone is and how they feel about you is pretty important to your survival. If I see Matt, and I know Matt, and I know Matt is prone to beating people with sticks, and he looks very angry, and he's carrying a stick, <laughs> that directly impacts my survival chances. Well, maybe not as Matt, but. He's going to bring a stick to the party. Yeah. bring a stick one day. It directly impacts your survival chances. If you knowing what an emotion somebody else is feeling is really important to you. And we get a lot of that data from faces, subconsciously. We, if somebody else is smiling in the same room as you, you will tend to smile, actually. If somebody is frowning, you will tend to frown. We're all kind of empathic like that. It's a very strange thing. You pick this all up subconsciously. So as a result, therefore, finding and parsing facing quickly, faces quickly is an adaptive trait. Me being able to go, oh, I know you. I'm going to run now because you look very mad is important. Or, hey, I know you, and you're smiling at me, and you're holding food. This sounds like a good time. So obviously, that only really covers kind of some of the pareidolia stuff. Why does the rest of it exist? Apophenia and the rest of things. Well, some of the hypotheses include things like your pattern matching in your brain is greedy. 
Cognitive biases are heuristics. Everybody in this room is pretty much, well, not everybody, but a lot of people in this room have coded things that may have performed weirdly when presented with unexpected data. And that's all really a cognitive bias is. You trained your brain, or your brain was trained back in the day, on a lot of things, a lot of data that is not necessarily going to be happening now. And when it's presented with data that it didn't train on, it could behave unexpectedly. So additionally, when it is training, when your, the brain was evolving, developing these algorithms, it is almost always advantageous for it to err on the side of, there is a pattern here, and I'm going to do something because of it, than to not see a pattern that does exist. Superstition kind of happens because we look at something and we go, oh, well, maybe it is because I did X that Y happened. Eh, I'm going to Pascal's wager that. I'm just going to do X all the time. And then hopefully that will affect Y. But if it doesn't, what's the harm? Well, the harm is you might be doing X and it may be actually detrimental to your health or somebody else's health or time. On the other hand, another hypothesis is that you get what you're looking for. If you set out to look for a pattern, your brain is probably going to find one. It might just invent one that doesn't even really exist just to present you with something because you keep looking for it. You want to find patterns. Your brain just naturally does as a result of that drive to push forward and find these things. So, well, what can you do about it? Well, in some cases, it's harmless, right? Pareidolia is not the end of the world. I see faces. Okay, that's great. I see faces on my, burnt, you know, my grilled cheese. This is a perfectly fine thing and nobody really cares until you start attributing meaning to it. So the first thing to do is be skeptical. Look at these things and go, is, am I actually seeing a face? Or am I just seeing data? Look at the data you're seeing. And am I actually seeing this pattern? Or is something else happening? Don't attach meaning to this phenomenon. You see a face. That means it's a face. Think about the Cydonia face on Mars. You've seen a face. That doesn't mean it's actually a face or that somebody put it there. And especially it doesn't mean that somebody put it there and it was aliens because they knew we'd come looking for it with the Viking landers eventually. That's a lot of chains of logic that you're going down. And this one's kind of more statistics based and you can really fall under this trap. It's called the type one error in statistics. Don't rely on manual analysis to find patterns in potentially random data. Because you'll, the type 1 error is, I've found a pattern that does not exist. And your brain will helpfully do this for you. So there's a whole bunch of analysis you're you need to be doing non-manually, or at least following a specific set of rules, in order to get conclusions that aren't tainted by type 1 biases. So I'm going to actually be giving a lot of talks about cognitive biases. I'm going to try and get as many of the major ones as I can. I doubt I'll hit 171, or you probably kill me before that happens. So, but I am going to try and hit a bunch of the major ones. I talked about two in my talk on feedback, uh, the narrative bias and uh, the uh, fundamental attribution error. And some of those are going to be the big ones that I hit first, like confirmation bias, the fundamental attribution error, narrative bias, things that affect you. And hopefully, I will help you figure out how, you, how that affects you in your average, your average daily life, because a lot of these things do. And then I will help you try and get past them and help me as well, because it's one of the things I want to do. I'm just trying to share the wealth. So does anybody have any questions? Oh, sweet. Thanks very much. <laughs>